Hello, everyone. Welcome today to the L Acoustics Workflow presentation. My name is Scott Sugden. I am Product and Technology Outreach Manager coming to you live from California. I hope all is well around the world wherever you are. Uh, for today's presentation, I have brought along a uh, expert crew of moderators and I want to introduce them and uh, let them uh, tell you a little bit about themselves coming to us from just outside Berlin. We have Tommy Melhorn. Tommy, how are you today? I'm pretty sure uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty good. I'm sorry. Pretty good. What a, what a nice word, isn't it? Um, hello from Berlin City. Uh, I hope you all are good. Well, the sun is shining here. Very nice, so it's good weather and all is good. Hallo, liebe Freunde der leichten Unterhaltungsmusik und vor allem der Beatmusik. Wir freuen uns, dass ihr wieder eingeschaltet habt und hoffen, wir haben eine wunderbare Zeit auf diesem wunderbaren Karussell äh, der tonalen Veranstaltungstechnik. Back to Scott, I would like to say. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. And let's head a little bit west, uh, just in the east of France. JC, how are you doing? Uh, what are you, about three hours east of Paris, is that correct? Uh, yeah, about four hours. Everything's OK here and uh, exactly the same like in uh, Germany. I think it's very sunny here and uh, everything's go very well, actually. Uh, bonjour à tous. Bienvenue, uh, bienvenue à tous nos amis français, québécois et tous les francophones. Uh, voilà, j'espère que vous allez tous bien et que vous allez passer. Nous allons passer un très bon moment là sur ce sur ce canal. Parler de, des workflow L acoustics. Bienvenue à tous. Je, je, je laisse donc la main à nouveau à uh, Scott Sugden. Thank you, sir. Um, Sergey, Sergey, you're in. You're actually in London proper, are you not? Correct, Sergey. Uh, I am in London. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Sergey, you're here helping us out as well, moderate and answering questions specifically about the Alacoustics workflow. And as I understand it, you speak uh, 43 different languages as well as model rooms in very high detail. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, well, English and Russian will do for now. So any questions in English, uh, I will try and reply. Any questions in Russian as well. Пишите на русском, отвечу по возможности. У меня клавиатура на память, я ей пользуюсь. Но привет всем русскоговорящим. Надеюсь, вам понравится сегодняшний вебинар. Excellent. Thank you, Sergey. So, starting out today. Thank you guys for coming and enjoying this presentation of the L Acoustics workflow. This is going to be a presentation describing the process from system design through on-site implementation calibration and operation of your L acoustic sound system. Uh, the goal of today's presentation is for you guys to understand the entire process that we have developed for you and how to use the individual tools. When you want to learn more about these individual tools, we're doing an upcoming set of webinars all about each one of these sets of processes, and we're publishing these after the fact as well, so you can take a look. And if you missed it, you can catch up in line. So please, um, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Step one. Let's think about the four steps of the process, right? So the first step is system design. So system design is all about venue modeling in high detail. It's all about designing the sound system specifically for your needs um, and to match the performance goals of the show. So that's all about the design process. And this is what we do before we get to the event site or hopefully in advance of the actual show itself. Step two is implementation. Implementation of the sound system is exactly that. This is where we install the sound system. This is where we configure our audio network. This is where we set up our and check our speakers to make sure they're operating correctly. Step three is calibration. This is where we match the system performance to the design objectives we did in step one. So calibration is all about matching the performance from the design and ensuring that the system is operating as expected. And last and of course not least is operation. This is showtime. This is where we can monitor the system in real time, both from an amplifier perspective and an audio perspective. We're going to take a look at the RTA built into Network Manager 3.0, and we're going to see what we can do with that. So step one, system design. The first thing we need is a 3D venue model. And the very minimum requirements are a 3D venue model of the audience geometry. So what I mean is we first need to model where the people are going to be, and this will help us understand where we need to point the speakers to and what kind of coverage and SPL distribution we're going to achieve. So the very first step is a detailed 3D model of the audience geometry. 
However, in sound vision, it's possible to have a more detailed model, including architectural elements. And we can think of those architectural elements of something even as complex as the bird's nest. And this is the Beijing National Stadium. And here we see the roof structure, that, that really intricate lattice roof structure. We can even see the audience and the seating tiers and all the aisles. Now, all of these details help us to do the best possible model, but they also help to enlist the confidence of the people who are producing the event. If the care is taken at this stage, it really helps out down the road. To develop that model, there's two basic workflows. Step one is a venue model from, a, from plans or from a CAD file. So we can imagine this from 2D and 3D plans, and we can develop this model from that process to come up with the audience and architectural geometry, or it's possible to do it from on-site modeling using tools like laser rangefinders and clinometers. And with some basic geometry, we can even draw rooms in fairly high detail on-site in just a few minutes. When you put all that together, what you end up with is a highly detailed 3D model to start implementing your sound design. Now, this is a model of a theater in Paris. It's about 1,400 seats, if I recall. Um, and what's really interesting is it's maybe about 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 discrete surfaces. This was modeled in SketchUp, which is a 3D modeling program, and imported with the L Acoustics plugin into SoundVision. And this really helps us come up with the best possible design. So let's go ahead and jump to SoundVision and take a look and see what we can do. So what I have here is the start of our modeling. Remember, step one is a 3D model of the audience geometry. And this happens to be a 3D model of the audience geometry right here. And it's a pretty simple model, but what's really neat, it was done with really simple tools within SoundVision. In fact, this is comprised of just two different elements. The first element is what we call a profile. And a profile is a set of depth and height points from a reference position. In other words, it's a distance or a depth and an elevation value for each one of these coordinates. And then we can describe simply the width in the back versus the width in the front. The only other element I have here is this front piece just to fill out the front area that was curved to match the profile of the front of the stage. So two elements and we've de developed a model in fairly high detail. And this model happens to be the Santa Barbara Bowl just outside of Los Angeles, California. In fact, it's in the download I sent to you guys in the Q&A. And if you haven't received that yet, go ahead and take a look now or after the presentation, and you can play around with this model as well. To enhance this model a little bit with some architectural detail, I've also put the stage in. And so here's our stage. And that helps a lot to understand the width in the front and where front fills might go. But I've also included the proscenium and the roof. And so now, with just this little bit of architectural detail, we have a lot more information about where we can place the PA and about where we need to add additional coverage. So we have a highly detailed 3D model, detailed as much as we need for a particular event. And step two is we can start to add in the loudspeaker systems. And for that, we can add in line source arrays like this K2 system. And within the L Acoustics workflow, we've developed a set of tools called auto solvers to simplify, accelerate, and improve the process of sound design. And here, what we've used is the auto display tool to help us find the best mechanical coverage for the venue. To do that, it's real simple. You as a sound designer need to define several objectives. The first is, how many loudspeakers do I have? In this case, I have 12 K2. Where are they gonna be suspended from? So the position here happens to be negative nine meters or to the house right or stage left nine meters slightly downstage of the origin because they're flown in front of the proscenium and an elevation of 10 meters high so i defined the position of my array and the second step i've done is set a sight angle in this case i set it high enough so that it shoots over the top because it so happens at this venue there's a little bit of standing people up on the very top and now with that i can define my coverage maximum point how far back does coverage need to go and how far forward do I want it? So right now we're covering out five meters. That means the front fills have to do the first two rows. And then we can use auto display initialize and optimize to come up with the best mechanical solution possible. It's pretty easy. Initialize just verifies that you have 
enough enclosures to cover the target. And in fact, we can see that we can cover 100% of our venue. And then we can define our SPL objectives in the SPL target window. And the goal here is to say how much louder in front of mixed position are you willing to let it get? And how much quieter behind mixed position are you willing to let it get? And the goal here is to set something that's reasonable and effective. And in this case, the default value of one dB for every 10 meters seems to work pretty well. So that's what I've left in. And sound vision auto display optimize will quickly come to the best mechanical solution for this particular deployment. And what we can see, we get about 92.5% of our on axis response within plus or minus 1 dB of our goal. So that's the best mechanical solution Sound Vision could find. And then step two of this design process of this workflow within Sound Vision is the electronic settings, specifically auto filter. An auto filter is an auto solver within Sound Vision to find the best electronic optimization for a particular deployment. So this takes into account the venue geometry. It takes into account the atmospheric settings. So these atmospheric settings can be set here in Sound Vision options. So if the temperature and humidity is a known value in advance, you can set that. And it also takes into account the amplifier resources you have available. So what's neat about this is you can set this to work with one amplifier per loudspeaker, or pardon me, one loudspeaker per amplifier, two or even up to three. And it'll do its best to find the best possible solution under those conditions. And it's as simple as clicking auto filter right here. And voila. So our target is increased slightly, but more importantly, my frequency response here is improved as well. Pardon me. The audience there. There we go. And voila. So this is now very consistent in the high frequency range. And in fact, we can turn that back off and do it again and see the results. So beforehand, we're still pretty good mechanically, but auto filter is going to improve that just a little bit. There you go. So when you're all said and done uh, in Sound Vision, you can save this file and you can get it ready to load into LA Network Manager as simply as that. So once you've saved your design, we're ready to move on to step two, which is implementation. All right, so let's go ahead and do that real quick. And we'll talk a little bit about implementation. Tommy, you've got a question coming in from Germany. Yes, there's a question from Germany. Um, <laughs> um, I'm trying to, to um, translate it right. Um, I'm not understanding the integrity 100%. So do you think, or would you mind uh, making a very short, a very short, in your case, a very short explanation for the integrity value? Sure. So in Sound Vision, we give you a couple of values, right? One is all about, let's see if we can go there. Great. One is all about the target, which is how much are we in our goal range. And so our goal here was this value in front of plus 1.74 dB and this goal in the back of minus 3.62 dB. So how close are we to that target? So 95.9% are within plus or minus one dB after we've done auto display and auto filter. And integrity is checking out to make sure we don't put, uh, have too much variance in the very high frequency. And this can happen when you put a very large angle in a certain portion of the array. So the, the scenario might be, um, I have a balcony and, and auto display or auto filter are trying to avoid that. It can cause a problem in the integrity of the coherence of the system. Does that work for you, Tommy? That's perfect. Thank you. Uh, Thank you guys. So moving on then to step two of the workflow, which is implementation, right? So we've done our design in advance. Tommy, we've done a perfect job of doing the best possible design. We've kept an eye on the integrity, on the coverage. Um, how do we get this on site and operational? Well, one really neat thing you guys can do, and maybe you've discovered this, maybe you haven't, is an LA Network Manager now, you can actually open directly a Sound Vision file. So what's really neat about this is I can actually open my Sound Vision model. So this is that .xmlp file uh, that we had from our design. And Network Manager will actually open that and load all the groups. So Sound Vision file will actually load all the settings and groups from your our network manager will load all of the files, the settings from your sound vision, including 
the group settings. So in this case, if I had any queue or a delay in the all group, it would be loaded. Any of the auto filter settings. So these are my auto filter settings that Sound Vision recommended, and those are loaded as well. And they're even synchronizable from the files. So in other words, if the design parameters update, the temperature humidity is updated, it's possible with an LA network manager to resynchronize your file settings from your Sound Vision file. So as long as you keep the Sound Vision file the same, uh, you can actually resync these. It's really easy to use um, and uh, uh, reload those file settings for you as well. All right, so we've loaded our file. We need to now connect LA Network Manager to the amplifiers that we have on site. And it might or might not match depending on what we think we have beforehand and afterwards. And so the very first tool we have is a really easy one. It's called the Unit Matcher. What the Unit Matcher allows me to do is say, hey, my virtual design from Sound Vision and or offline ahead of time has a P1, for instance, on IP address 100. It turns out my P1 is actually on IP address 100 versus 1. So I can simply drag the virtual P1 to match my physical P1, and I can do the same thing with a set of amplifiers and match those to the LA rack and the P1 I have behind me over here. And now all I have to do is match and solve for family conflicts. And a family conflict is very simple. I thought I had a K2 preset. The amplifier has an X8 preset. So what we need to do is say, hey, amplifier, you're actually going to be using it in K2 because that's what this is designed for. So I just accept that solve family conflicts button and we're good to move on. Back to my screen here, what do we see? We see the P1 has gone to IP address 100 and it's white, which means it's online. And the amplifiers are 101, 102, and 103. And they also are online as well. So we've now matched our system ahead of time. So we're ready to go from that aspect of implementation. The next thing is to check to make sure everything is properly attached. And to do that really simply, um, we have the load checker. So load checker can be accessed here by the load checker menu. Um, or more importantly, it can be checked by selecting and control K uh, on a Windows keyboard or command K on a Mac. And that will load the load checker here. And this test simply checks a loudspeaker to see if it matches the preset that's implemented. Hmm. And it came up with an error today. And that error is because it was expecting a K2 low frequency and a low and a mid and a high. And it turns out the only thing it found was one loudspeaker touch attached to amp channel one, and it doesn't match. So something's wrong. Now, the good thing about this is the load checker will be safe to use from any preset to any enclosure. So that means if you have a 5XT or an X4I plugged into a KS28 preset, load checker is perfectly safe to use in that situation and will not cause any damage. Um, and it helps you identify mistakes in patching or number of enclosures or if there's a component failure in the enclosure itself. So the problem here is I have an X8 plugged in, so I'm just gonna switch this preset over to X8 real quick to demonstrate this. Okay, and let's reload load checker there and refire it. There we go. So load checker, oops, cancel that. Load checker has worked. It's turned out green and it said there's one X8 attached to amp channel one. And in fact, what's really neat about this is it's checked both the low driver and the high driver of this passive X8. And it's giving me a measurement, the black line of the measured impedance of that driver that's attached to that amp channel. And what we can see is the measured impedance of that is matched to the expected. So we're expecting it to be in this range. So it says, hey, you have one X8 plugged in, all is good. Um, and you're ready to go. So if you expected to have one X8, then this is perfectly fine. We can move on to the next step. So I suppose uh, the one thing we forgot to do was fly the PA. So we can go ahead and fly the PA as well. Let's do that. There we go. Time to fly. Everybody missed doing load-ins. I know I really do. I'm not much of a fan of load-out, but I like load-in. So LA Network Manager, um, we've now got our system configured. We have the right presets in the right places as we've expected. Um, we've configured any additional groups. So the import from SoundVision will come with all the groups in SoundVision 
for instance, the folders. So that would be the all group, the main and the subgroup, the main group, the subgroup, so on and so forth, and all of the auto filter groups. But what it won't come with is anything additional if you, for instance, want to measure one particular thing. So in Network Manager, we use a group for anything we want to mute, solo, gain, delay, change polarity, or now measure. So we got to set that up. The second thing we need to do as well is we need to uh, change and set up and patch our AVB network. There we go. And so to do that within an amplifier, you can choose your input source, pardon me, and your input source could be analog AES or now AVB. And with that, we can see available AVB streams. In this case, I have an AVB stream from the P1 and we can attach that amplifier to that AVB stream. And we can even see that its input is locked in green to this P1 for AVB. So all of that can be done in advance. So let's talk a little bit about AVB for a second and we'll come back. So in LA Network Manager, in the L Acoustics workflow, in the L Acoustics ecosystem, we're using Milan AVB networks. So uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. And the devices that function on this Milan AVB network are the P1 reference front of house processor. We now have the LS10. Ooh, the LS10. All right, so we have the LS10 as well. So the LS10 is an Avenue certified AVB switch that's specifically designed for our needs, right? So what are our needs? It's got Ethercons on it. It has the ability to use a redundant power supply and that redundant power supply actually comes from another LS10 in the rack. So one LS10 can back up another. Um, it has two SFPs on the back, so you can use fiber optics for long distance runs. And what's really neat about this is it boots in five seconds. So in five seconds, you go from power on to passing network traffic. Uh, the way I like to think of it is it actually boots faster than the actual amplified controllers do by about two seconds. So it's ready to go before they are to pass audio. We have the LA Rack 2 AVB. I have one behind me. That is three LA 12X amplified controllers and two LS10s for fully redundant Milan AVB networks. We also have the amplified controllers, the LA 2XI, which was just announced a few weeks ago in Amsterdam at ISE. We have the LA 4X and the LA 12X amplified controller as well. So, Milan AVB networks, right? Um, first and foremost, AVB is plug and play. There's no configuration for the user to do. So all the things like bandwidth reservation, uh, priority uh, scheduling are all managed automatically in the firmware of the device. Milan AVB networks also have clocking stability that's several times better than what's typically seen on an ethernet based network. They deal with that bandwidth reservation automatically. So if you try to connect two devices together and there's not enough bandwidth to make that work, uh, it won't authorize the audio signal or the media signal to pass. And they're what's known as deterministic. Every single packet you send on an AVB network gets to its destination unless there's a physical failure, a power failure of the switch, a cable failure. Um, with Milan also, there's an optional setting that L Acoustics has adopted, which allows for dual redundant. So you can have two physical networks. That's the idea of the LS10 and having two of them in the rack. You have two separate physical networks and those two separate physical networks allow for a physical failure of one network and a continuation of audio without any interruption, which is really quite neat. So back to network manager and the workflow, um, we can do load checker. We can load any presets we need to. We can uh, match our units from our design um, and we can set everything up. So the next step to do is to go on to system calibration and system calibration is where we match the performance of our design. So the goal of calibration is not to be doing design work. We shouldn't use calibration as the time to, uh, to match the performance of speakers in terms of design, but we should match them to what our goals were. So this is where we say, hey, the goal of the front fill was to do this. We're going to match it to that scenario. For calibration purposes, L Acoustics has developed the P1, which is the front of house processor. It happens to have four mic pre's on it. We also have M1, which is our integrated measurement software integrated into every single version of LA Network Manager 3.0. To access M1, you need a couple things. You need to have a P1, and this is how you capture data. However, you can actually use M1 without having that P1 connected if you've already captured the data. And to access M1, you just click on the button on the left here called M1. This launch is a pretty simple three-step process. 
Step one is the record tab. The record tab is where you choose your measurement locations and a location is anywhere you wish to measure the sound system and acquire data. And for each of those locations, you're allowed to program in the setup page the groups you wish to measure. So in this case, I've already prepped this in advance and I set it to the location house left one. We're gonna measure the group house left and sub left. And to add a location, it's as simple as add location. And you just touch the groups you wish to measure and you're ready to go. The other thing we can do is configure our P1. So in this case, I'm gonna turn on phantom power, that's great. And I'm just gonna set the mic pre to be something usable. There we go. And when I go to the tuning page here, back to M1, we can actually see the VU meter of my microphone. Let's see if I can bring this up on screen as well. Voila. There we go. So I actually have a microphone into a P1 as well. And if I tap on that microphone, like you're not supposed to do, you can see the VU meters responding. You can select your mic source, one, two, three, or four for each of those locations. You can select your uh, source for your signal. So in this case, they get all their signal from AVB1 today by chance. And we can arm as many locations as that we have discrete mic inputs. So what's neat about this is M1 is gonna manage the process of data organization. It's gonna automatically index it's automatically going to name, label, mute, so on and so forth, and you're ready to go. And then at that point, you can just hit the start record button. And once you've done all that and you have your data, you're ready to go. Let me just reload the session one more time since I've changed a few things. Great. Here we go. So what we can do here as well is in the EQ page, what we see is the matrix of the measurements we've taken across the groups we've taken the net. And you can look, in that, look at the individual measurement at any one of the locations. So I can turn on as many of these as I'd like. But one thing we've learned about the process of system calibration is it's really important to look at average across multiple locations. That's the best way to remove local variables that can cause problems in your measurement. We can do the same thing for the subs. I can look at one location of sub. Or the average of all eight locations for the subwoofer response. So these are the measurements we took when we were at the Santa Barbara Bowl some time ago. But I can also see what happens when I add two things together. So you have this third column, which is sum. And you can activate the sum. You can actually activate the average of all the different sums. And now this is the average of the sum of these two groups, and we can see how they're working together. What's really powerful about M1 is every single time we take a measurement, we're storing the metadata of the entire system. So what that means is we're storing its current gain, delay, EQ, and polarity status, and it becomes possible to change any of those settings. So what I can see right here is the EQ that's been applied to these set of measurements, and we can turn on or off any of that EQ and see how it's gonna affect the measured result. So that means I can take some measurements when I have time, no matter the status of the DSP of the system. So whatever the gain or delay is, or EQ, and I can change any of that after the fact without additional noise and see how the system responds. So this works for anything you measure, any group you measure, and any group that contains all the members of one of the groups you measure. So if it contains all the members of, for instance, the subwoofer, then that shows up. So here's my subgroup, even though we measured the subs, sub left. So we measured sub left, but I can see the subgroup and I could actually apply an EQ at uh, 55 Hertz. I like 55 Hertz, so let's add plus six dB. And what I see is it's been added to the sub response only. Just like that. So the last step, within LA Network Manager 3.0 and M1 for system calibration is auto align. And auto align is a tool that we've developed to help simplify and accelerate this process. Uh, the goal here is to find the best alignment, both in time and phase, between any set of sources. So I'm gonna start at front of house here, for instance. This is my reference position, right? I wanna make sure it's really good there. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab the group sub left, but I wanna apply my delay, polarity, and gain settings to the group of subs. So it's actually put on both stereo system. Then I'm gonna add the group of house left main 
but I'm going to apply it to the group main once again. So that's where the delay and gain settings will go. So first and foremost, what do we see here? We see the two responses and we see the dark line or the shaded area is the sum of the two. Um, and you can change your smoothing and see how this affects the, the response visually. We also get this quality indicator on the bottom that tells us the quality of the summation. And we can actually see that it says there's a bit of a problem at say 55 Hertz. Well, if we change the smoothing and maybe we zoom into that 55 Hertz, what I can see is that the sum of the two is at times dipping below one of the two responses. That means there's a bit of a phase difference there that's causing a, an anomaly. So we can figure out how to solve this. And there's two ways to do that. The old process would have been to uh, look at the phase traces and align those as best you can. And that, that's a, a reasonable solution, but it's quite challenged at times. Um, in AutoLine, we actually have a set of auto solvers. And this tool is really simple. It finds the best possible alignment in magnitude, phase, and time. And just by clicking on the number one option, it says, hey, what you should actually do is add three milliseconds or so to the main PA. And lo and behold, all of that summation issue has gone away at this particular location. So this is the best choice for this location. What's really neat though is, well, I did that. It updated the quality bar indicator for every other location. And I can see that over here and I can actually see it's caused a real problem um, at this particular location. So at house left one, there's a really significant problem, significant enough that it's turned red. And here I can see that we're losing quite a lot of energy, which is this shaded area from the sum of these two at this particular point. So this choice might not be the best for this particular location. And this is where you guys as sound designers come in to find the solution that works best for your particular scenario. So I might say, let's put one millisecond here and see if it's mostly better in most places. And when I did that, oh, there's still a little bit of red on house left one. You can go to zero millisecond. And we're doing a lot better there. So now it's a slight compromise at mix, but it's also a slight compromise here. We don't see red anymore. We just see a little bit of orange. So we're trying to find that best solution that works for most places. It's a really good tool to help you guys do that. Um, and whenever you do that, you can even go back and see what's happened over here. And you can see the effects here. And all of that has been automatically put in instantaneously into our groups and network managers. So this is all in real time, which is really great. And if I change a setting here, in fact, I go to five milliseconds when I go back to M1 and I go back to auto line, all of that's been updated as well. So there's that five milliseconds and we can see the problems that's caused. So if you change a setting later on, you can track all that back and forth, which is really great. Voila. All right, let's just change one thing back here since I loaded that file. We'll do that and we'll go here. All right, so last step is operation of the system. So operation of the system, it's showtime. We've done a great design. We've suspended and hung the PA. We've checked to make sure that the AVB patch is correct. We've set up our AVB network. We have uh, load checked the system to make sure everything's patched and working correctly. We've done our calibration and matched the system on site to our objective from the design. Now it's time for operation. Uh, what possibly has changed since showtime? Uh, since the design, well, of course, the weather's changed. And so we've developed a tool called AutoClimate to help you track the system response in real time and adjust for changes that happen due to atmosphere. So back in Network Manager, um, if you go to the tuning page, you see the AutoClimate button. What AutoClimate does is it gives you a readout of a couple of things. First off, our design from SoundVision was set to a reference of 19 degrees Celsius and 75% humidity. So what does that mean? In SoundVision, we expected this for atmosphere. It turns out on site, it's a little bit different and we can get that information two ways. It so happens the P1 comes with a probe and that probe is really nice. So I'm gonna hold this up to the camera. You guys can see that. So this is a USB probe that plugs into the front of the camera here. Um, pardon me, the front of the uh, P1 USB, and it reads out the current temperature. So in the room I'm at, it's 24 degrees Celsius. We can see that on screen here and 34% humidity. I'm gonna breathe on it a little bit. Take a drink of water to breathe on it. All right, and the humidity should start going up because it's getting a lot more humid around that probe now. 
And so we can load these settings that the P1 probe is measuring just by clicking on it. And now it says that, hey, the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and 47% humidity. And what that is suggesting us in autoclimate is that you should increase the autoclimate filter with this fader. And what's nice about this is you guys can slowly make this transition during the show as the weather and humidity and temperature change to track the system response. And what that's actually doing is for each auto filter group, based on the design distance, it's changing the amount of air compensation that's being applied. Right? And it's a nice slow process. You guys can do this at your leisure. And when it sounds correct to you, for instance, oh, it's a little too bright at that target because my mixing engineer has has made a few modifications. We can we can go to where we want to and stop. So you guys are still in control of this. We're not just loading a bunch of settings at once. So that's auto climate. So within Network Manager, we have two auto solvers, which is auto line and M1. We have auto climate. And last and not least, we have the RTA. So the RTA is great. It's uh, really simple. You launch it, it loads in a separate window. And that separate window can be moved from this screen to another one. So since you can put this in front of the front of house engineer and you can calibrate this if you have a mic calibrator as well. And then that way you can see the response to your system in real time. Uh, this is the microphone once again that I have here. So we can see it's measuring around. We can look at up to all four mic pre's on your P1 processor um, and take a look at those to see what the system response is doing. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate uh, you guys joining us today to learn more about the workflow process from start to finish through design, implementation, uh, calibration, and operation. Uh, if we have any questions, I'd love to take them. Uh, if you want to join us tomorrow, uh, Germain Simon, our product, uh, uh, one of our product managers is going to present to you guys the A series. Uh, it's a new, uh, medium throw line source array product for both rental and installation applications. And on Friday, our head of ed education, Francois, is going to present to you guys a variable line uh, source optimization. So this is a really great presentation about how to optimize a line source array. This presentation is very agnostic. It's, it's about line source arrays themselves. Uh, we just so happen to use L-Acoustics products to demonstrate the techniques and tools. Uh, any questions for the field out there, guys? Tommy, you good today? Yes, I'm. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, forcing. I'm punishing my keyboard to uh, <laughs> answer a lot of questions. But yeah, anything is fine here. There are some Great. some specific uh, questions regarding the M1. I think, as far as I know, we are working on a specific M1 webinar, right? So maybe we have yeah. a chance to answer more questions there. Yeah, guys, we're gonna we're gonna get in. We've got uh, some time here, obviously, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna do a whole couple of days on M1 on measurement and calibration. The schedules will be posted shortly, um, so please uh, stick tuned to our social media. Uh, check out our Facebook and Instagram, our website, to find out more about those. Uh, JC, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you were able to help a few people answer some questions. Uh, I hope all is well. Please be safe, be healthy, and I can't wait to see you soon in Marco C. Yes, of course. Uh, thanks a lot to everybody, and it was a great time. Yeah, uh, I think we got a lot of question about uh, um, redundancy in AVB, so I think we will uh, maybe talk about that in this A1 session also. So uh, hold on for uh, this uh, this next webinar, I think. And for everybody, take care uh, until next time. Yeah, that's exactly it, JC. We're going to do a presentation, uh, some st some talks on AVB specifically and uh, how that all works. And we'll get to that once again in the coming days and weeks. So uh, please don't hesitate, however, to send out questions you guys might have in social media, and we'll see what we can do to, to, to work the schedule around everyone's desires and needs. Sergey, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, please be safe, be healthy, and uh, say hi to everyone in your family in London. Thank you very much, and uh, еще раз привет всем uh, русскоговорящему uh, миру. Uh, еще раз uh, нажимайте на ссылки, смотрите семинары, будет еще много чего интересного. Всем пока-пока. Thank you, Sergey.
Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, join us tomorrow, same exact time about the A series and Friday, same exact time, all about variable curvature line source optimization. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Please be safe, be healthy. Check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, uh, we'll talk to you guys more later. Cheers. Bye-bye.